So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Euromed 15. And uh, this is the third edition of our clinical trials uh, discussion. And to uh, start things off, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Nishanta Veerasinghe. Uh, he will be presenting on the ABC trial. Over to you, Dr. Nishanta. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my presentation is on uh, ABC study, that is uh, anticholinergic versus on a uh, botulinum toxin for urgency in the incontinence. Research question is uh, in women with urgency in the incontinence, how does to one time intraday truce injection of 100 unit Botox with respect to episode of incontinence. <laughs> this was a multi center study in, uh, done in the United States. Uh, was changing the mean number of uh, urinary incontinence episodes over the course of six months as reported for three-day periods uh, in monthly bladder diaries compared to baseline. Secondary outcomes are proportion of participants uh, with complete resolution of uh, urinary incontinence, proportion with more than 75% reduction of uh, urinary incontinence, scores on several validated quality of life questionnaires and adverse events. When considering the results, uh, the baseline mean episode of uh, urinary incontinence was 5.2 plus or minus 2.7 in the anticholinergic group and 4.8 plus or minus 2.7 in Botox group. Uh, on analysis, they found that reduction in mean number of uh, urinary incontinence episodes are similar in both groups, 3.4 versus 3.3 with a p-value of uh, 0.81. And uh, interestingly, there was a complete resolution of symptoms, uh, which was more, more likely in the Botox group, which is 27% compared to 13% with a p-value of uh, 0 0.003. In both groups, the quality of life improvement is similar. And there were similar rates of adverse events, uh, but when um, assessing this adverse event, there were higher chance of dry mouth in anticholinergic group and higher chance of UTI in Botox group. And uh, there were more women in Botox group reported self catheterization, especially early after the injection. So efficacy wise similar, quality of life uh, wise similar, but the side effect profile is different in the uh, two arms. And there is a complete resolution uh, chance is more likely with the Botox. In conclusion, um, the ABC study remains the only randomized control trial of Botox versus anticholinergics, and it demonstrates similar outcomes of both treatment with respect to symptoms of urinary incontinence. Botox associated with increased UTI and higher rate of patient requiring self intermittent catheterization. Therefore, uh, in guidelines, uh, um, the Botox is used as a third line therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nishanta, uh, for that excellent uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, sir, uh, any comments? Uh... Nishanta, what is the sort of uh, <coughs> uh, order of treatment of urge incontinence at the moment, Nishanta? At the moment, uh, there is um, lifestyle modification and pelvic flow muscle training to start with, and mm -hmm. then uh, we can go with the uh, yeah, and then go with the uh, medical treatment, yeah. and failing which, uh, the, as a third line treatment, the uh, Botox and other treatment after um, urodynamic studies. Mm -hmm. The solifenesin they have used a fairly small dose, no five milligram. Five, milligram. five milligram. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 
this uh, what is your experience it altered in uh, nishant i don't know what is better so solifenosin no uh both as um, similar effect in sometimes but some people do uh, respond to the, some other drugs but the side oh, effect profiles are okay no? but uh, the the selectivity uh, solifenosin is selective okay. m3 and others not selective tolteridine mm -hmm. is not selective all right that's the thing no mm -hmm. yeah so botox is the third third option no yeah third option sir mm -hmm. so efficacy seems uh, efficacy seems but the side effects are uh, uh, more all right okay because uh, one is this uh, selectivity other than is i mean uh, that uh, cognitive dysfunctions depend on the whether it is tertiary or quaternary or mine and whether they are transport out of the brain by g protein that is a uh, permeability yeah. glycoprotein Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because no, I just asked that in practice, I have found that uh, tolteridine was a little better than solifenosine. I don't know the sponsors. Supply sponsoring, the, sponsoring, they might get upset. What I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> they are promoting solifenosine. <laughs> <laughs> no, these just are. Uh, these not related to the exam or evidence-based medicine. I just asked. I think Gopi is there, sir. I think I, he just got connected. All right, yeah, that's good. Gopi, yeah, I, I, I think uh, there was no electricity. Yes, now I got I the know. electricity back. Right, sir. Good, good. Now you are discussing the Botox paper. Yes, sir. Nishanta says uh, mm -hmm. ABC study called uh, anticholinergic yeah. versus Botox. As tolipenacin. It comes after solifenosine or anticholinergic? So in the algorithm, Gobi? Yes, sir. For, yeah, we had to uh, try the anticholinergic first, and if it refractory to that, mm. uh, then, then, then the oxybutins. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. No? Even right. they say sometimes to combine the two anticholinergic if the patient is okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. so, Gobi, is there an ICS definition for I couldn't find this uh, refractory OAB because what the definition says is if they use one or two medication, if they are not responding to that, they, they label it as is, is is, uh, refractory OAB. Is there a uh, a definition for that, uh, So we have to use at least a month of uh, one anticholinergic to get the benefit. Uh -huh. And the correct, correct dose. And if, uh, but, but the nice thing is the, we have start with the low utility tablets like oxybutynin or tolteridine. Not not to start the solifenosine straight away because it, it's a bit expensive. So use one, and if not responding, use a, another group of drug. Still no response, we can combine. Then we can move to the you know Botox. How is the effect of Botox? Is it sort of permanent thing or? How long will it last? Average in median, sir, it's uh, six months. Okay. But it can last from uh, six to 12 months. Right. Then uh, we have to, depending on the patient, we have to give the injection again. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is, again, the dose is different depending on whether it's a idiopathic activity or genetic activity. So uh -huh. IDO 100 units. If it's a neuropathic, we have to use the 200 units. Right, right. Okay. Okay, thanks. Shall we, shall we move on to the next discussion? Is that all right? Yes, yes, then. Uh, okay, uh, so the next presentation is going to be by Dr. Nishantan, and he is, he is going to be presenting on the Thomas and the Opus trials.
and you'll hear me. Yeah, we can hear you and your screen is shared. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, today I can discuss uh, Thomas trial. So this is a, a retro we're comparing it's a randomized trial where they wanted to compare the effectiveness of the retropubic versus transobturator uh, midurethral sling, which are used to treat uh, stress incontinence. This uh, article was published in the New England Journal. And uh, research questions were, uh, since there was uh, initially for the stress incontinence, uh, birch, pulpo, uh, suction, or autologous slings were uh, used. Then uh, with a uh, randomized control trial, they said uh, with a midurethral sling is uh, more or less equally effective uh, compared to this uh, two uh, mode of treatment. So thereafter, there was two uh, uh, slings were available, midurethral sling, uh, retropubic and transobturator. So there were uh, no studies to prove the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of both. So this study is uh, comparing the both uh, sling, midurethral sling, in the patients with uh, stress incontinence. And also they are comparing the uh, adverse effect. Uh, study type multicenter interventional uh, randomized control trial. It includes uh, nine centers, uh, Birmingham from the UK and various states of USA. The study, pe study period is two years from 2006 to 2008. Patients involved in the study is 597 female patients. The follow-up period is uh, 12 months following the uh, midterethral sling surgery. Uh, this is the inclusion criteria. Patients, uh, female should be 20, more than 21 years and uh, patients should have more than three months history of pure or predominant stress incontinence within the mixed uh, incontinence. If it is a predominantly stress incontinence, uh, that also considered, included. And they should have uh, urinary stress test at 30, 300 ml of bladder volume in the uh, test uh, examination and urodynamic stress test was not required. So not necessary. The initial three factors should be there to include patients. So how the assessment initiated preoperatively before doing the midurethral sling uh, patient was assessed clinically uh, and with the questionnaires and uh, cystoscopy assessment also done to exclude other causes and urodynamic uh, study also done because they wanted to compare the uh, objective uh, factors uh, for following the treatment. Even though they have recruited the patients with the clinical parameters, uh, UDS also done. Post-operatively, they have used the clinical examination and also questionnaire, mainly uh, on the second and sixth week and also sixth and uh, 12 months. Uh, at the 12 month of uh, surgery, uh, they have done the urodynamics. So types of surgery, they have done a retro pubic fling uh, they have used the tension-free vagin vaginal tape. The brand is Gynecare and uh, transobturator sling. They have used two slings, uh, tension-free vaginal tape obturator. These are the brand name. It, it was uh, placed into out. The starting, uh, in, they have inside, uh, starting from the uh, vagina and they will come out through the obturator foramen. The other one, American medical system, where they out to in, start the uh, insertion from the uh, uh, from outside groin area, then uh, they enter into the vagina through the transobturator foramen. So these are the two names they have used, into out and out to in. Uh, and uh, in this study, they have uh, even though uh, they have used the uh, midurethral sling 
for uh, stress incontinence so they the if the patient has uh, a patient had a vaginal surgery that means the uh, uh, uterus prolapse so in that case the the surgeon uh, has uh, allowed to do uh, vaginal surgery for that prolapse so while doing the midurethral sling uh, if the patient is uh, indicated to have prolapse surgery that also allowed to uh, go for the surgery so outcomes uh, so treatment success uh, assessed uh, subjectively and objectively uh, subjective criteria uh, we need to consider it as a success absence of uh, self reported symptoms uh, where the they have used uh, used the misa uh, questionnaire uh, validated questionnaire and also no leak, no leakage recorded in the 3 day voiding diary uh, bladder diary there is no leak and no treatment for stress incontinence is uh, subjectively considered as uh, uh, success objective criteria uh, one negative uh, proactive stress test and one negative uh, 24 hour pad test and no treatment uh, retreatment either behavioral or pharmacology or surgical for the st stress incontinence these are considered objectively as uh, success so the this is the uh, chart will show the primary outcome uh, they have assessed since there were uh, some uh, differences in uh, valsalva uh, um, uh, pressure uh, gradient so they have adjusted uh, accordingly between the uh, um, trial population so to trial population they have adjusted and as well as unadjusted uh, things are uh, factors uh, numbers are here so more or less they have according to this chart less than 12 or uh, more than 12 is considered as uh, there's deviation other they according to their power study so according to this study both are objectively and subjectively equally effective success rate is equal 80 and 70 there's no significant difference in that and also subjective uh, success also 62 and 55 but there's no significant uh, statistical uh, difference so then uh, if we consider the adverse events uh, retropubic swelling uh, because the surgical uh, access is different where we are going through the uh, retropubic space uh, more prone to get uh, injuries organ injuries so high uh, is uh, it has commonly there are so other complications as well common complications are bladder perforation and uh, post-operative void in dysfunction uh, we have done the surgery for uh, uh, stress incontinence instead of that they have developed uh, retention which needed a surgical intervention and also frequency of uh, urinary tract infection these are common with retropubic sling group and instead of that uh, we're in the trans obturator uh, sling where these com uh, complications are rare but they are common to have neurological uh, symptoms since we are going through the obturator foramen they are having leg pain uh, and numbness those kind of neurological symptoms were higher in that uh, study group uh, secondary outcomes so uh, initially they haven't planned but since they have used the two types of uh, trans uh, obturator slings uh, even though they haven't done the, even though they haven't done the randomization they have so compared to uh, each type out to in into out there's no significant difference between these two groups other than the, there was a slightly higher chance of vaginal epithelial perforation in into out approach and effect of uh, concomitant surgery so there's uh, whether the patient had a concomitant surgery for the organ prolapse or not there's no significant difference in that so in conclusion uh, both myth uh, urethral slings are equally effective but complications differ with the procedure 
uh, surgeon has to discuss with the patient uh, regarding the uh, surgery and complications. So this is the uh, EAU guideline where uh, they have uh, mentioned it gives a strong recommendation to uh, give a mid-urethral sling where the patient is having uncomplicated stress incon uh, incompetence, incontinence. And we have to, uh, when we are offering the uh, management, we have to uh, uh, inform the complications of the individual surgical procedures. Thank you. Are the slings still practiced or how? Tips. Nishan, unmute. Uh, I haven't seen, but uh, we here we used to do birch pulp as a, a suspension and uh, autologous sling. But uh, slings, uh, I'm not sure, sir. Most of the yeah, they are allowed. No, I'm just telling the tapes are not allowed, no? Oh. In UK and all? Oh. I'm not sure, sir. Yeah. So, so, what they have censored UK, uh, so there is a lot of restriction now. Yeah, all right, okay. So, only uh, specialized centers can do that. Okay, all also, right. Also, they have uh, said uh, they must have a training a certain number of cases and they are okay. also registry that registry uh, they have to maintain with the hospital and also they have informed the outcome. Mm -hmm. So it's not a restriction. Basically, you can't do much. Mm -hmm. so what they have recommended, I can just read that. So this is uh, NHS recommendation. Uh, undertake if appropriately trained and operating regularly. Ah, oh, okay. Report right. every every procedure to the national database. Ah, oh, right. Register of operation should be maintained. Complication via the MHR medicine and uh, product regulatory agent. Accreditation of special center for uh, the tape repair. There should be accreditation. Okay. Right. So, and uh, yeah, but uh, there is a letter they have post the TOTs and TVTs. And that was extended in March 2019, but I don't know the, the current situation. But of course, yeah, it's not widely practiced. Okay. Right. So, autologous ones are preferred. No, that is what uh, that person said No, at the sessions also. Yeah. Richard, Richard Morley. Yeah. Roland and Morley. Sir, uh, the bulk, uh, bulking agents becoming uh, prominent, but of course, they are not permanent. You have to give every yearly or monthly. They give a mid urethral uh, injection of bulking agent. Like the same thing they inject uh, to prevent the vesicular urethral reflux. Uh -huh. So, trans or uh, they inject uh, macroplastic or hydrogel. Uh, so that's basically a kind of mechanical obstruction, but with the time it can wean off. So that injection again. So at the moment, autologous slings and birch corpus suspension and uh, bulking agents are the things widely used rather than the TOP and TVT. Okay, right. So we have a rough idea, no? And uh, last time, Manjula said, no, if stress urine incontinence is not mixed, you don't need urodynamics also before surgery. Yeah, if there's a previous uh, surgery was done for a stress urine incontinence. It must be a complex surgery, no? Uh, for example, just abdominal hysterectomy or something also? No, no, what? not that, sir. It's an anterior or posterior repair. All ah, right. 
or uh, previous cesterior incontinence surgery. Okay, okay, right. That's, that is the value trial, sir, we discussed last time. That's right. say, um, uncomplicated stress, no need, sir. Like uncomplicated EAU yeah, right. says, uh, recent pelvic surgery, previous surgery for inner incontinence, pelvic radiotherapy, something like that. Sir. That's right. Like yes. Yeah, recent pelvic surgery. Yeah, okay, okay. Recent, no? right, right. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sir. Uh, I think, uh, just as I remember, posterior repairs were not considered, no, only anterior repairs. I think, not all pelvic surgeries, I think. Okay. Okay. Extensive pelvic surgery and anterior or apical pelvic organ prolapse. Yeah, anterior and apical, yeah. All right, okay. That's the thing, because otherwise you get a lot of restrictions now. Pelvic surgery is also not that uncommon. Right, okay. Shall okay, we move on you. to the next one? Yeah. So, drugs have no place. No, Balagobi, uh, for stress incontinence like duloxetine and all are not recommended. Duloxetine recommended, sir, for a mild, uh, moderate ah, incontinence. Okay. First, they recommend uh, pelvic flow exercise, ah, right, deep surgery okay. creams, okay. and duloxetine. Uh, those are still used, sir, but. Uh, and okay. things, yeah. Right. So now we all know, no, basically what to do. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so moving on to the next presentation, uh, it is going to be on the embark trial, and it will be discussed by Dr. Nalin Palahepitya. Over to you, Nalin. Hello. Can you see my slides? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Delina. Uh, I'll be discussing the Embark trial, which is a, a, a trial that was done in 2009 to 2011 and was published in 2013 in the uh, Journal of Urology by the American Urological Association. And uh, this study question, uh, the study question was whether botulinum toxin or Botox is a safe and effective treatment for patients with overactive bladder and urinary incontinence who had been inadequately treated and managed with anticholinergics. The, the definition of inadequate treatment with anticholinergics were, uh, was that uh, if the patient had been on anticholinergics, but it had been stopped due to either adverse events or uh, due to uh, lack of uh, clinical effectiveness, if the anticholinergics have been stopped, it was regarded as inadequately managed with anticholinergics. So uh, this was a large multicenter placebo-controlled phase three trial, uh, which was conducted among 72 uh, centers uh, across the states, as well as in Canada. And the inclusion criteria was uh, the patients should have been 18 years or older, and they should have been diagnosed with overactive bladder. Uh, here, compared to ABC trial, the inclusion criteria, the definition of overactive bladder was rather uh, with a lesser threshold. So if the patient has experienced three or more urgency incontinence episodes within three days, compared to uh, the ABC trial, it had been five or more, but in the uh, Embark trial, they have considered three or more urgent incontinence episodes within three days period with Average uh, frequency of micturition per day should have been eight or more. So uh, in summary, it should have been, the patient should have had urge incontinence more than three times within three days, as well as their micturition frequency should have been eight times per day. And uh, another inclusion criteria, important inclusion criteria was that the patient should have been treated with anticholinergic therapy beforehand, and it should have been discontinue because either because of adverse events or either because of uh, less efficacy or treatment response. And the exclusion criteria was if the patient is currently on anticholinergics or if the patient had been on anticholinergics up to seven days before the screening process, the patients were not included in the study. And uh, so they included 500, uh, 
57 patients for the study and uh, they were randomized one in one into two groups. That is uh, the placebo group and the Botox group. So in the placebo group, uh, they got 277 patients assigned to the, uh, the placebo group and 280 patients were assigned to the botulinum toxin A group. And they followed up uh, the patients up to 24 weeks uh, to measure the primary outcomes. The first primary outcome assessment was at 12 weeks uh, and uh, uh, they were followed up, up to 14 weeks uh, post procedure. The procedure wise, the, both the patient groups underwent either flexible cystoscopy or rigid cystoscopy. And uh, both the groups got intravesical injection. Uh, the placebo group uh, got a placebo injected in, uh, into the uh, detrusor muscles. And the Botox group also got injection of 100 units of Botox uh, into intramuscular layer not to the submucosal uh, layer, but intramuscular injection of Botox, 100 units diluted in uh, 10 milliliters of normal cell. And then they were followed up every two weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, and 24 weeks with regards to symptom improvement, which was assessed with uh, validated questionnaires, as well as uh, validated questionnaires to assess the quality of life. So in results, it was uh, shown that the, the demographics of the study group showed that the major uh, component of this uh, study group or the uh, patients included were females in both the groups. And in the placebo groups, it was around 88%, whereas in Botox group, it was around 90%. And uh, overall, the, the age group, though we have, they have included uh, patients more than 18 years of age, most of them were more than 65 years of age. So 65 to 75 age group, there were about 40%, 42% in both the groups, whereas there were 15%, uh, close to 15% uh, patients more than 75 years of age. And uh, the primary outcomes wise, it was shown that uh, the uh, uh, urinary incontinence episodes within 24 hours had significantly reduced in the Botox group at two weeks, 12, uh, six weeks, and 12 weeks. And uh, when they assessed at 12 weeks, uh, heart, uh, the, the, the patients who have got uh, uh, no urinary incontinence, that is 100% cure at 12 weeks, uh, there were 29% or 23% of patients in the Botox group had achieved 100% continence at the uh, primary outcome assessment at 12 weeks. And uh, compare, uh, compared to the uh, treatment response rates that was described by the patients, uh, it was statistically significant that the uh, Botox group had a better response rate compared to the uh, the placebo group. And with regards to the uh, quality of life assessment, it was shown that there was a significant, uh, statistically significant improvement within, within the Botox group compared to the placebo group. So uh, when they considered the adverse events, uh, obviously the Botox group had a higher rate of adverse events, but uh, the serious adverse events wise, the, both the groups had a similar uh, percentage of uh, severe adverse effects. But compared uh, to the placebo group, the Botox group had a uh, higher chance of developing UTIs and dysuria and bacteriuria following the Botox injection. And so they concluded that uh, the treatment with Botox, 100 units intravesical injection for the patients with overactive bladder and urinary incontinence who had been previously managed with anticholinergics but failed therapy, uh, when they received botulinum toxin, there was a significant and clinically relevant improvement in the uh, overactive bladder symptoms, as well as the perception of treatment benefit. And it was shown that there was a significant positive impact on the health related quality of life as well when uh, Botox was given for overactive bladder. And uh, the 
they concluded that the safety profile of vortex was uh, in the manageable state. So this appeared on 2021 uh, uh, PAU guidelines for the management of non-neurogenic female low tract symptoms. So they strongly recommend to offer bladder wall injection of Botox 100 units for patients who have been uh, refractory to conservative therapy such as uh, PFMT and uh, anticholinergics. Uh, a similar study, uh, but a different uh, approach is currently going on called the Apollo study in which they are uh, instilling the bladder uh, with Botox plus hydrogen, uh, not uh, injecting it into the bladder wall or the uh, bladder musculature. The study is still going on and which was, was to be concluded in 2021 August. Uh, the results have still not been published. Uh, uh, similar but not exactly what we were discussing, uh, uh, there's a meta-analysis paper in which they have uh, identified 19 original studies which had analyzed Botox injection, whether it was superior to placebo or not. But here, uh, the, the MBAC study was uh, mainly concerning on idiopathic overactive bladder, but uh, in this meta-analysis, they have considered even the neurogenic depressor of overactive as well. So their conclusion, they have given a different dose as Dr. Balagobi said, for neuro, uh, neurogenic overactive bladder or neurogenic uh, depressor overactivity, they recommend to use either 200 or 300 units of Botox injection. So overall, uh, the final uh, take home message on the Embark study is to use 100 units of Botox injection for idiopathic overactive bladder uh, uh, who had been initially treated and failed to uh, get a good response for anticholinergics. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nali. Uh, so, uh, uh, Anurudh, sir, anything to add or anything to discuss? Nali, other than the infection, what, what is the other major problem with Botox other than the placebo? Major I think they problem. got uh, yeah, uh, urinary retention following the uh, yeah. Botox injection. So they recommended that the patient should have been trained for CIC before uh, enrolling into the study. Yeah. So uh, maximum benefit of Botox is achieved in how many weeks? Uh, they say it's 12 weeks. Yes. Uh, and uh, that can go up to 24 weeks. And uh, the pharmacological wise also, what they say is that uh, the, the anticholinergic or the, the, the blocking of acetylcholine the exocytosis by the Botox uh, yeah. will be reduced by 12 weeks. That is, they suspect that they are developing antibodies against botulinum toxin. So what percentage of patient became completely dry after the Botox? Uh, they, uh, at 12 weeks, it was 22%, 22.9%, yeah. I think. 22% so of the patient became completely dry. Almost 25% became dry after the Botox. What percentage of patients become completely dry after giving solifenacin? I think it's around 5% or 9%. I can't exactly remember. Half of this number, so it's around 13%. So half of this number become completely dry with solifenacin. Uh, with oxygen, is 25%. So when you give Botox, sorry, yeah, when you give Botox, 25% become completely dry and 50% there's a reduction in the urgency. So the efficacy of Botox in, in uh, idiopathic detritus overactivity is 75%. So 50% become, uh, you know, re reduction in the urgency and 25% become dry, completely dry. So 50 plus 25, 75%. But if you take same Botox for the neurogenic detritus overactivity, two third become reduction in the urgency and one third become completely dry. So efficacy is more than 90%. So Botox is better in neurogenic uh, retrusal overactivity than the idiopathic retrusal overactivity. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Gobi, this is Dr. Satishan. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Diabetic, diabetic patient has neuropathy and overactive bladder. Is it idiopathic or neurogenic? So it's very sorry. muted. So in the definition of idiopathy detrition overactivity, exclude the diabetic neuropathy. So it's not coming under the, if you see the definition of idiopathy detrition overactivity, all uh, organic causes, including diabetic neuropathy is excluded. So then it's becoming a neurogenic detrition overactivity. Okay, thank you. But it is difficult to exclude diabetic neuropathy, no? Clinically, so urologists... Yeah. That will be the issue. Ne? Yeah. So theoretically, it looks good. Yes. But for the exam, you can tell like that. I also was surprised if you see the definition of uh, idiopathy detrition of overactivity, they exclude the, all the pathologies, including yeah. the diabetic neuropathy. So it, it's That's difficult. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what they mean by NDO, sir, usually the, the spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis. So they, they are not mentioning diabetic neurogenic mm -hmm. right, so Of right. course, this won't come in under the idiopathic also. So it, I don't know. Maybe in the middle. <laughs> um, the thing is, when I type MBAC, it came as like enzalutamide in. Uh, is that another MBAC also, but the same spelling? Yeah, there are three MBAC trials, actually. One for Botox, one for enzalutamide, and uh, there's another one for some uh, uh, dermatology thing. So it's a, it's actually a MBAC group which has uh, conducted. So I think, uh, I, I don't know, uh, Dr. Balagobi, do you have any ideas? Is there a group called MBAC study group? I don't know, but I mentioned, uh, I, I was uh, thinking about this embark. Yeah, basically embark versus uh, dignity trial. So both for uh, uh, overactive bladder and uh, bottle and toxin. We must be have discussed the dignity trial as well, isn't it? Or someone is um, discussing. Dr. Sridhar Tilipiruma was allocated it. Unfortunately, he couldn't join today. Uh, okay. So... Hopefully, we might be able to discuss it some the other time. Trial. If you want, I've just summarized the dignity trial. So it's similar to the embark trial. Only different is embark trial is done on uh, idiopathic overactivity. Dignity trial was done on neurogenic detrition overactivity. That's the difference. So mm -hmm. the patients were basically uh, spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis. They were failed on anticholinergic. So three arms, one arm plus C4, other one is uh, 200 units of Botox, other one 300 units of Botox. At the end, they have said uh, 200 is equally equally beneficial like 300. So they recommended the uh, 200 units of Botox for a neurogenic detrition overactivity. And as I said earlier, two third big, uh, reduction in two third of the patient had a reduction in the urgency and one third completely dry. So more than 90% efficacy. That is a dignity trial. So previously what we were discussed was embark trial, both for a, a one for a idiopathic overactivity, other one for a neurogenic detrition overactivity. Yeah, I think we can move to the next one. Yes. Uh, so uh, the next presentation is going to be by Dr. Hillary Fernandez. He's going to discuss about uh, suspend trial. Over to you, Dr. Hillary. Thank you. Um, one moment till I find the okay. Um, can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can. 
Right. So uh, I will be discussing the suspend trial, the spontaneous urinary stored passage enabled by drugs. This uh, the research question was uh, in patients with ureteric corticoid stones. How do alpha blockers and calcium channel blockers compare to placebo in promoting stone passage and managing symptoms? Um, and this is a multi-center randomized controlled trial held in 24 UK centers. Um, and it began in year 2011 and was published in the Lancet in 2015. And the inclusion criteria was like adults aged 18 to 65 uh, with at least one stone 10 millimeter or less in diameter in either ureters. And they excluded patients needing immediate intervention, patients with urosepsis, and uh, patients with uh, EGFR less than 30, and all um, uh, the patients who are unable to take the medical expulsion therapy, the alpha blocker or the calcium channel blocker. Uh, 1,167 patients were randomized one into one into one into tamsulosin, nifidipine, and placebo arms. And they were administered either chancellosin 0.4 and ifidipine 30 or placebo to be taken once daily. And uh, uh, until four weeks. And they followed the patients up until 12 weeks. The primary endpoint, the primary outcome was stone passage in four weeks, which was defined as the absence of need for additional interventions. Uh, and the secondary outcome was uh, assessment of the pain and uh, use of analgesic use, uh, time to stone passage, and uh, the health status uh, by assessing the short form SF36 uh, questionnaire, uh, and the discontinuation of the medication due to adverse side effects. And uh, into the results, 75% or more stones were less than five millimeter or less in diameter. And uh, rates of stone passage as defined by no need for further intervention. The similar for both arms at the tamsulosin versus placebo and nifidipine versus placebo arms. So there was no difference at 12 weeks uh, for the need of any additional interventions in either of these arms compared to placebo. Um, and uh, there was no indication of subgroup effects based on the gender or stone size or the stone location. And uh, serious side effects, uh, none in the tamsulosin group. Nifidipine, they had three, and the placebo group, they had one. And overall, the suspend trial failed to demonstrate a benefit from medical expansion therapy for ureteric stones. And uh, so when you analyze everything, all the data, the alpha blockers and calcium jam blockers may not be beneficial among patients with, may only be beneficial among uh, patients with larger stones, more than five millimeter stones in the ureters. And uh, less than five millimeters, the spontaneous stone passage was unaffected by adding a medic medical expansion therapy. And uh, this is a well, uh, uh, organized randomized control trial and it had impact onto guidelines and the AUE guidelines um, recommend a trial of medical expansion therapy uh, for patients with distal ureteric stones um, smaller than 10 millimeters and the EAU uh, they recommend trial of medical expansion therapy for Distributory stones larger than five millimeters. There are a couple of similar studies. One of the studies done in US um, uh, with 512 patients, we using tamsulosin and placebo arms, and similar results to suspend trial. They showed no difference. And one large trial from China, they randomized 3,450 5, 5, patients. And uh, they found uh, about 
present absolute risk reduction in favoring uh, tamsulosin group. And they also mentioned the benefit is more for larger stones, larger than five millimeter stones. And there is a systematic review uh, in a, which included the suspend trial as well. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, like uh, the benefit is only for larger stones, uh, larger than five millimeter stones when you use uh, medical expansion therapy. Over to you, Tilina. Hello. Hello, sorry, I my mic was muted. Sorry, thank you very much for that comprehensive presentation on a very important topic. Um, Andrew, this, sir, uh, uh, anything to discuss? Uh, so, uh, is uh, Hillary, how uh, about uh, psilocin? Is it better than tamsulosin? It is more selective, sir. Um, the, but we didn't find any study, though. Uh -huh. uh, sir, Nishant, here. Uh, uh, yes, Nishant. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, there's no evidence of the any any superiority about um, in, uh, comparing the two drugs. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then uh, I think Hillary mentioned about uh, another uh, uh, meta-analysis over sixty uh, randomized control studies. So that is what we call a Cochrane meta-analysis. Uh, so I think in if somebody is asking for sort of medical expulsion therapy. Uh, I think the discussion should start that this is a bit of a controversial issue. And then there are again, I mean, evidence towards medical expulsion therapy and there are evidence against medical expulsion therapy. So I think uh, suspend trial is against medical expulsion therapy. And the other one is the mimic trial. And those, I mean, both trials are like, more or less similar. Uh, only thing is MIMIC has retrospectively analyzed and uh, suspend is a high quality study which has done it in a prospective manner. Mm. Uh, but both of the studies, they haven't found any sort of um, I mean, benefit in medical expulsion therapy. But however, there are two other studies which will discuss about the benefits of the medical expulsion therapy. That one is the Cochrane meta-analysis the one over 60 uh, randomized control studies. Uh, so they have concluded that there is a benefit for stones, uh, mainly larger stones, more than five millimeters. Yeah. And then the other one is the Farik et al. So another randomized control study. They have again looked into the benefit, uh, again concluded more than five millimeter stones and this one they have suggested distal stones i think having look at all these things the eau guideline now strongly recommends uh, medical expulsion therapy for distal uh, uretric stones mm. so that is the conclusion uh, yeah. at the end thank you Um, shall we move on to the uh, next presentation? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so next presentation is um, actually Dr. Munipriya. He will discuss about the sister trial. Uh, and also since uh, Dr. Suranga is uh, uh, sick, uh, I think Dr. Munipriya will try to cover the upstream trial as well if possible. <laughs> Thank you, Tilina. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah. yeah. Right. I will start from the sister trial. Uh, that is the, the, the stress incontinence uh, surgical treatment efficacy trial, uh, which was published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in two, 2007. And uh, it's compared the virtual suspension versus the facial sling to reduce the 
urinary stress incontinence. So study question was in women with the stress urinary incontinence, how does an autologous rectus, faci rectus facial sling compared to the birch colpus suspension procedure is benefit. So it is a multi-center randomized control trial comparing two procedures among the women with the stress incontinence. The one is the pubovaginal sling using the autologous rectus fascia and uh, other, other arm is birch colpus suspension. So this uh, picture describes the uh, two method, the birch colpus suspension, which is the uh, using the uh, threads uh, anchor into the uh, Cooper's ligament or the pectineal ligament, uh, either side of the, the vaginal wall, elevating the bladder neck. And uh, the autologous sling, again, the uh, using the, uh, the urethral sling, it is proximal urethral sling, the use the rectus uh, fascia, and it is anchored into the rectus uh, muscle, uh, again, the proximal uh, uh, surrounding the urethra proximally anchoring the uh, thing. So primary outcome uh, is overall treatment success. That means the negative pad test, no self-reported uh, leak on three days voiding diary, no self-reported stress urinary incontinence symptoms or the negative stress test or no treatment further. Uh, other primary outcome is stress urinary incontinence, specific treatment success, that is negative stress test, no self-reported stress urinary incontinence symptoms or no treatment further. Also, uh, secondary outcomes were assessed, that is the complications, quality of life, sexual functions, treatment expectations, and the patient satisfaction. So initially, the there were around 2,400 patients included, but ultimately the study included only 655 patients randomized. That is uh, one arm, uh, the birch colpus suspension arm, 329, actually 328. One is not undergo assess surgery. So other arm is 326. And uh, completely follow, uh, completed, follow up completed uh, in birch, arm in 255 versus the other arm is 265. So overall, the, the final analysis included 329 patients in the Birch arm and the two, 326 in uh, autologous arm. So overall treatment success favored in facial sling over the Birch uh, procedure, that is uh, uh, statistically significant and did uh, the uh, stress urinary incontinence specific uh, success rate is uh, around 66 percent at the 24 months of surgery follow-up. So rate of uh, serious adverse event uh, when we compare with the birch the more adverse if events in uh, uh, slim procedure that is uh, urinary tract infection is the most commonest thing. And the post-operative voiding dysfunctions, again, uh, and the uh, urge urinary incontinence, the common in sling procedure than the birch, uh, mainly the voiding dysfunction is common in uh, sling procedures. The treatment satisfaction at 24 months was higher in sling groups than the birch group. Uh, but uh, that is not uh, statistically significant. Only the 86% uh, is uh, satisfied and compared to the 78. However, there are no apparent effect of uh, concomitant pro uh, prolapse surgery on outcome measuring in the either groups. So in this head-to-head uh, -head comparison, the sling placement had better continence outcomes than the, uh, those who underwent the colpus suspension. Uh, however, the higher rates of urinary infection, vo uh, voiding dysfunction, urge incontinence among the sling procedures 
uh, the so because of that uh, that is the main disadvantage of the sling procedure however findings uh, have supported shift towards the sling procedures mainly the autologous versus birch colpo suspension in clinical practice but uh, as we discussed initially also the because of the synthetic uh, uh, slings have so many uh, complications and uh, litigations arise because of that uh, nowadays uh, EAU and both uh, AUA both uh, recommend the autologous sling but uh, both uh, whatever the sling procedure or the birch call for suspension before the take the patient into theater they have to discuss with the patient the risk and benefits and everything so that is the recommendation of eau and aua guidelines nowadays so what is the take-home message nowadays the autologous sling has main uh, place for uh, stress urinary incontinence compared to the birch call for suspension but uh, uh, that is uh, depend on the uh, how surgeons are experienced and uh, we have to discuss with the patient to uh, decide uh, what is the method she need. Thank you. Uh, so shall we continue the same or I, I will wait? Uh... I can I can do it. Ah, right. I, I, okay. I, I, I will. Okay, Dr. Saranga. Okay. <laughs> Monipriya, could I ask yes. a question? Uh, uh, yes. Now, uh, in this uh, study, how did they select the uh, patients? Is there any any sort of uh, comment on uh, the category or the type of stress incontinence which they selected? Because we all know that uh, if it is type 3, uh, like intrinsic sphincter deficiency, that has a direct uh, impact on the uh, outcome. Oh. Any comment on that? Um, Have they done the video aerodynamics and categorized the type of uh, stress incontinence and randomized the patients? Or, or you, you didn't look into that or what? Yeah, yes, I didn't uh, go that much of details, but uh, okay. what they have uh, told uh, is this summary, they were excluded uh, because uh, inclusion, the, sorry, inclusion criteria. There were inclusion. Uh, I didn't go through detail actually. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm of course not aware about this uh, study. I couldn't look into it, but uh, mm -hmm. I think in uh, uh, important point, a practical point is uh, when we discuss these patients uh, in, in even in UK in the functional MDT. Uh, there are a few things that uh, we look when we look at the choice of the uh, uh, incontinence procedure. So uh, if it is a sort of, a, I mean, there are common principles. Now, the first thing is that uh, the, uh, the type of incontinence, if there is an intrinsic sphincter deficiency, uh, birch culpa suspension is not very effective. Then we may have to think of more of a bulking agent or uh, autologous fascial sling, because uh, retropubic autologous fascial sling compared to the trans obturator sling will increase the urethral resistance. So that will be much helpful than the birch culpa suspension if there is a sort of intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Uh, but if you do the birch culpa suspension for a patient's intrinsic sphincter deficiency, it might not uh, so work very well. So that is one of the concerns that uh, you think when you are deciding on uh, uh, the type of procedure. Other thing is the, uh, um, then again, if you say there is a patient with uh, urethral hypermobility, you can either <coughs> select sling procedure uh, or, which means autologous sling, or you can select uh, Birch culpa suspension. Again, the choice will depend on the age of the patient because birch culpa suspension is tend to last a little longer than the autologous fascial sling. So if the patient is younger, uh, they always 
think of going into uh, uh, birch corpus suspension, but if the patient is older, uh, all these uh, complications and the other thing is the, uh, the uh, long-term efficacy is not going to be a big problem. So you think of a sling procedure. But as you said, uh, now, I think uh, you may have discussed about the uh, discontinuation of the um, synthetic uh, sling, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Basically, uh, they, they, basically, they were included the, the stress predominant urinary incontinence. That is the main... main Think, uh, the, but uh, they, they didn't uh, assess the type of the, the stage of the incontinence like that. So they, they didn't uh, undergo any urodynamic study prior to this study. How? Even the endpoints also decided by this uh, PAD test and bladder diary. So, yes. I think the void function is also because of the uh, the, the selection of uh, retropubic uh, slings because that will improve the retro resistance anyway. Whereas if you go for a trans obturator, uh, the chances of uh, voiding this function is much less. So, uh, sorry, my understanding on this topic is very limited. Uh, but uh, even if there is uh, no uh, significant hypermobility, uh, the, uh, or is even in isolated cases of uh, this uh, intrinsic sphincter deficiency, will uh, uh, say the birch uh, work? I mean, um, I know it won't be the ideal, but uh, uh, I think, yeah, you know, I think. It will work, but uh, when you deciding the set of factors, for example, if you have a ideal one, would be the other one. Yeah, ideal one, but then again, you you decide on based on various factors, like you know, if there is oh. a uh, at least some <coughs> degree of hypermobility, uh, and the patient is younger, it's always better to go with a uh, laparoscopic burst stop suspension or something similar. Uh, but if the sort of patient is older, then you want to do some quick procedure. And then there you uh, try and go and do a uh, sort of autologous facial sling retropubically. But I, have, I haven't I have seen uh, uh, the uh, retropubic, uh, sorry, a trans obturator route of autologous facial sling. Um, all the, uh, I mean, the place where I was, I was trained, they were using a uh, birch valve suspension and the uh, autologous fascial sling, retropubic. Bladder, no, bladder neck suspensions are no longer done, is it? It is no longer done, yes. Uh, so shall we move on to the next uh, presentation? Uh, so we are glad that uh, Dr. Suranga uh, could make it despite uh, having uh, fever. So he will discuss about uh, the upstream trial. Dr. Suranga, are you I have shared this. So here. I don't know if they can share this and then I will tell. Actually, yeah, we can see your screen. Yes, 
coming up. Surang, can you forward to me? I will share. I, I, I think I, I have sent it to email. Ah, email. email yes. Oh, sure. Um, if uh, this is taking time, shall we move on to another presentation while we get the technical issues sorted out? Yeah, Selina, we'll move to the next one. Yeah. Uh, it's better to move, I'll, but I can't uh, say right now. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I think uh, we'll move on to the next presentation and then we'll sort out the uh, your one next. Right, so uh, next is going to be Dr. Taha. He will be presenting on uh, Revu trial. Over to you, Dr. Taha. You can see my slides, I think. Can you see uh, my slides? No, still you're sharing the um, uh, application. Uh, just uh, share the PowerPoint. I think from the share screen, select the PowerPoint. I am sharing. Can you? No, I think you're, you're sharing. All right, now okay. Now it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay. Right, fine. This is the review trial so that is the randomized intervention for children with vesicoelectric reflux. The question was in children with vesicoelectric reflux diagnosed after a first or a second febrile or symptomatic urinary tract infection is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole prophylactic prophylaxis effective in preventing further recurrences. That was the research question to start with. Right. So there's research done in uh, the trial done in USA with nine pediatric centers, inclusion children under six years of six years of age with grade one to four VUR and 102 and 102 febrile or symptomatic UTI within four months, exactly 112 days. Uh, exclusion, children with grade 5 VUR, no febrile or symptomatic UTI, and children with coexisting other urological anomalies like anatomical anomalies. Sample size was 607 children. One to one randomization with trimethoprim 3 mg per kg and sulfamethoxazole 15 mg per kg versus placebo. They followed up these children for 24 months and they have done technetium 99 DTPA at the baseline and after one and two years to assess real scarring. <clears throat> 
endpoints were primary outcome, febrile or symptomatic UTI recurrences. And uh, secondary antimicrobial resistance and failure to response. The results mean age was 12 months. 484 out of 602 children had grade 2 or 3. Sorry for that type type mistake. Grade 2 or 3 VUR. 91% of children had experienced at least one prior urinary tract infection. Antimicrobial resistance was substantially more common in prophylaxis group. More detail to be compared with two groups, recurrent febrile or symptomatic urinary tract infection is more in placebo group, 37% versus 25% with absolute risk reduction of 11 or to almost 12%. On the other hand, there's no a significant difference between uh, in, in uh, prevention of renal scarring between groups, two groups, almost 12% and 10.2%. Recurrent febrile or symptomatic UTI due to resistant organism, those occurred more in antibiotic prophylactic group, 68% versus 24%. In conclusion, among children with VUR after UTI, antimicrobial prophylaxis was associated with substantially reduced risk of recurrence, but not of renal scar. So similar study, again, prevent study, it is done in Austria. They showed there's a 6% absolute risk reduction in favor of prophylaxis group. So there is a <coughs> benefit of uh, 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 reducing the current urinary tract infection in antibiotic prophylaxis group. So implementation. So AUA guideline says if age, sorry about that, that should be less than one year. AUA less than one year, they should have continuous antibiotic prophylaxis. If child has a history of febrile UTI or grade, any grade, like even one to two grade, even if there's no history of febrile UTI. And regardless of uh, whether they had prior UTI or not, all the children with grade three to five should have antibiotic prophylaxis. On the other hand, EAU guidelines, what they tell is, if the patient is less than one year, uh, continuous antibiotic prophylaxis, regardless of grade of scarring. And if there's a breakthrough infection, we should switch to a therapeutic parenteral uh, infection. The child is more than one year. Uh, AUA guideline says continuous antibiotic prophylaxis should be given to children with bowel or blood of dysfunction and may be considered in children with uh, no history of uh, bowel or blood uh, dysfunction. So basically, if it is less than one year, we should start regardless of grade. If it is more than one year, only for grade three to five. In the pediatric group here in Sri Lanka, I asked them, they continue for two years and they follow up with, uh, if there is no breakthrough infection or there is no uh, progression of scarring, they might stop at uh, two years, antibiotic prophylaxis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Taha, for that uh, presentation. Uh, uh, any uh, comments? Uh, That day, what did the pediatric surgeon say? Uh -huh. Did we discuss about this uh, reflux? Uh, there was no time, no? I think I didn't think we discussed about reflux.
Actually, I inquired from a pediatric surgeon so today itself. So what he said was uh, the same thing. They continue if it is less than one year, regardless of uh, grade they start. Uh -huh. They continue for two years and they monitor the breakthrough infection and the renal scarring says they might stop at two years. Uh, there is mm. no breakthrough. Right. Uh, no progression of scarring, sir. Mm. Only grade four, they said they might do surgery. That is also real, you know. Yeah. They said most times they don't do now, no? yeah. unless. Mm. Yes, I mean, spontaneous resolution in grade one is 90%, grade two is 80, grade three is 50, and uh, grade four is 20, and grade five is less than 10%. So, um, so uh, this is a uh, uh, maybe a little unrelated to this, but uh, regarding vesicurated reflux with patients uh, who are going for KT. Uh, um, now, usual our usual practices is to kind of offer bilateral nephrourethrectomy because we are thinking it might be a source of infection and usually these patients have recurrent UTIs because it's a redundant uh, sex are there. So, mm. so uh, do, do we, now today one of the pediatric nephrologists uh, got asked our opinion, do we always have to do that now? If, especially if there is no significant hydronephrosis and it's em emptying completely. Hmm. I actually don't know Tilina the answer. Things are practically the pediatric group, the nephrons are I mean develop or growing. That is why they need uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for adult population. Uh, I think uh, no need. I don't know. Tilena, mm -hmm. I think uh, now if the patient is completely coming out of uh, hydronephrosis and hydrolyte after voiding, in that case, I don't think we have to go for a prophylactic uh, nephrectomy, isn't it? But in yeah. most of the but uh, but in most of the time, uh, the childrens uh, we have to do because uh, they have tortuous uh, dilated uh, tortuous uh, ureters in native kidneys. We, because of that, most of the time, uh, in our MDTs, uh, we recommend the uh, bilateral nephroureterectomy. But in, but in adults, if the patient is developing again and again urinary tract infection even after the uh, transplantation, then we have to consider, I think, a nephrectomy for that population also. Hmm. Yeah. I think uh, I think the uh, patients who were referred, uh, I think there were two or three patients referred to me before uh, transplantation, but all of them were having recurrent infection episodes. So I think the patient's uh, profile also we need to consider. Uh, when we are thinking of uh, offering them uh, nephrectomy for native kidneys. So I guess it's still a safe alternative since they're going to go ahead with uh, immunosuppression to offer the nephrectomy. Yeah, Especially that's right. Even, even if it is completely... I mean, most, of the, most of the native kidneys are like shrunken and uh, uh, at the end stage renal disease, they are most, uh, most of the time shrunken and they are like uh, non-functioning uh, anyway. But uh, I particularly don't know about the uh, refluxing uh, kidneys in adults, uh, refluxing uh, native kidneys. But probably if they are having recurrent infection, I think uh, they'll have to come. Yeah, I don't think there is enough scientific evidence to say yes or no, no? But we just work out because some of these patients have associated bladder dyskinesia also, which causes the problem of infections. No? Yes, yes. So it's a mixed bag of cases, I think. That is why we don't see a uniform pattern until we identify those groups and collect data and do a good study. We will never know the correct answer. But <clears throat> as you all say, if the patient is getting infections, Despite the transplant, it is worth uh, trying to remove it and see whether it helps. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, so, shall we move on to Dr. Suranga's presentation? His uh, presentation is up. Uh, so, over to you, Dr. Suranga, to discuss about the upstream trial. The urodynamic prostate surgery trial is a randomized evaluation of assessment method upstream for diagnosis and management of blood output obstruction in May. Uh, actually, this was published. It is a, a randomized control trial, multi centric, done in UK and published uh, in 2015. The research question is. Uh, uh, does invasive urodynamics influences surgical decision making as reflected in differ, uh, differing surgical surgery rates? Uh, so whether we uh, do a urodynamics study before uh, but out for obstruction surgery uh, that will uh, prevent surgery or uh, any delaying uh, surgical intervention, or any changes in uh, decision making of uh, that uh, blood out for obstruction uh, surgery like URB or like or anything. So the method is uh, they have taken uh, men who have low tract symptoms uh, seeking treatments, uh, either surgical intervention or medical treatment they have taken. And then routine diagnostic pathway were done actually. The, uh, they have recruited 820 patients, the mean age is 68. And uh, they have done a routine diagnostic path like uh, IPSS score and uh, Laura test and urine deep sick test. And that is a routine diagnostic path. And uh, it, it is supported by the guidelines as well, NICE and uh, EAU as well. And then they divide into two groups. They are randomized into non urodynamics group and urodynamics group. Uh, 428 for non urodynamics and 381 for Eurodynamics. And they have observed uh, for 18 months and then uh, they have uh, judged that 46% that means 183 out of 400 uh, people who are in non-Eurodynamics group had a surgery, either TURP or OLEP or in kind of uh, blood outflow obstruction surgery. Or uh, in the Eurodynamic groups, it is 52%, uh, 199 out of 375 recommended for surgery. So in com when you compare these both arms, there is no significant difference actually. Both arms are same. So uh, finally, the uh, outcome was uh, the surgery rate were almost identical in both pathways. So doing a urodynamics is not uh, helpful. And it is a cost effective and it is an invasive procedure. And, uh, and, uh, so, and <clears throat> other thing is <clears throat> the surgical decision, um, they can reflect the current guideline. Actually. The NICE guideline says uh, not doing the urodynamic in each and every patient, and you can go for a clinical uh, decision. So that will supported by this uh, uh, study, upstream study. Uh, but, uh, and th there's a need of selective approach for urodynamics. For example, if the Qmax is more than 10 ml per second with obstructive symptoms or those with dead truce or overactivity, then you can uh, suggest urodynamic as a selective basis, but not for the each and every patient who need uh, blood out obstruction. So, this is uh, supported by the EAU as well as a nice guideline, and they continue the. Uh, and for a uh, procedure for a uh, management of blood outflow obstruction. Uh, that's the take home message. Thank you, Dr. Suranga, for that presentation, uh, despite your difficulties. Um, so, uh, Andrew, this, sir, anything to add? Uh, so, so, sir, uh, what are the indications that uh, we should uh, think of doing urodynamics uh, for a patient with blood outflow obstruction? Is it more than Qmax, more than 10 ml per second? Is the uh, pre residue is, say, more than 
some amount 800 or 1000 is that an indication to think whether there is a concomitant uh, alternative pathology so the indications uh, i mean if we have uh, any doubt of diagnosis number 2 is if the patient cannot go it uh, more than 150 and the post was in more than 300 the other thing is uh, too old and more than 300 and voiding lats and awaiting surgery and the other one is too old or too young that is less than 50 more than 80 again predominantly voiding and uh, awaiting surgery yeah and the other two is failed uh, blood outflow uh, surgery, surgery or, yeah previous surgery yeah and also the uh, suspicious of uh, coexisting neurological disease so all those are the indications of urodynamics before blood outflow surgery thank you sir anything else uh, to add uh, sir regarding this trial i think that's uh, those are the indications no <laughs> some people consider previous radiotherapy also to the pelvis sometimes uh, as a this thing indication to do urodynamics to be certain then you can sort of all these uh, instances where you do urodynamics is to Uh, sort of prognosticate the outcome, isn't it? <clears throat> you do the blood out at surgery, but you tell the patient, you know, your, your outcome may not be that good if you have concomitant neurological problems, as evidenced by the uh, urodyne, so that you are safe and you can uh, sort of prognosticate better. So in our setting, that we. I think uh, in our practice we do it with the sort of clinical sense more mm. or less. I think uh, because uh, the litigation and all uh, that mm. not that common, so yeah. we always give a trial of TURP and then. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, we do for extreme cases, no, Nishan, that even the TURP yes. because of the problems of theater time and all, isn't yes. it? So I mean, they will not be bad off even if you fail. But if you are doing for sort of moderate symptoms, is the problem? You might get yes. them continent. If the patient is on a catheter anyway, say a Parkinson's and patient comes with a enlarged prostate and he is on a catheter, all your trials have failed. You might as well do a TURP and see whether we can make him catheter free. Even if he becomes incontinent, then you put the catheter and keep him. So he hasn't lost anything. Uh, yes. So it's not a big issue, as you say. But if you are doing it for mild to moderate symptoms, then you are risking uh, the press, uh, this thing resulting in incontinence. Then you are worried. That is the issue, as you say. It's really the clinical judgment uh, is what we do most of the times. And since we operate for extreme cases, it's not a big issue. But for your exam, you need to remember these things. I think. Okay. No. Yeah. Shall we move on to the next presentation? It is uh, going to be uh, by Dr. Achyutan Mangaleshwaran. He is going to uh, talk about the Promise MRI first and 4M trials. Over uh, to you, Achyut. Good evening. Can you see my slides? Yeah. And uh, can hear me as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be talking about three uh, researches which uh, mainly concern with the use of multi-parametric MRI uh, in uh, guiding for uh, transrectal biopsy or prostate biopsy. So the first uh, trial would be the PROMIS trial, where they compare the diagnosis accuracy of uh, MRI versus truss biopsy and whether uh, MRI can be used as a triage, as a screening tool to decide on biopsy. Uh, if you take the second study, that is MRI first Uh, study. In this study, they are seeing whether after the MRI is taken for all the patients, whether a systematic and targeted biopsy is any difference uh, after MRI using MRI. So that is the second trial. Uh, third trial is uh, they are doing trust biopsy for 
for the patients and only for the necessary patients with the MRI uh, abnormality detector, they are doing the MRI guided biopsy and seeing whether there's any difference made by that. Uh, so if you look at the, all these trials, they are done on patients who are biopsy naive. That means previously they have not undergone any biopsy. Uh, so if you look at the research questions, I have categorized all three together to compare them easily. Uh, if you take the PROMIS trial, so they are using uh, multi-parametric MRI to see whether they can avoid unnecessary trust biopsy so that uh, we only concentrate on uh, uh, clinically significant cancers and whether there is a uh, difference in diagnostic accuracy between MRI and the trust biopsy. Uh, if you consider MRI first, so they are seeing whether multi-parametric MRI will improve our detection of clinically significant uh, prostate cancer, so more or less similar to PROMIS. If you take the 4M trial, so they are using different pathway. One is trust-guided pathway and the other one is MRI-guided biopsy pathway for more than uh, uh, normal levels prostate CA and see if there's any difference. So uh, more or less uh, the period of the trial published was almost similar, almost one year apart for each trial. All these three trials were multi-center prospective trials. Uh, there is a difference in the inclusion criteria. Uh, if you take PROMIS trial, it considers PSA less than 15, uh, MRI first uh, less than 20. This one, uh, the last uh, 4M trial, it considers any PSA value over three. And there is a significant difference in the age group. The PROMIS and MRI first, they're considered on 18, more than 18 years, any fit patient for the procedures. But uh, 4M trial, only the age group of 50 to 75. So this study was done in Netherlands, the third study, the 4M trial. So there is a difference in the inclusion criteria. If you take the exclusion criteria for all three uh, studies, mainly they are seeing any, the uh, patient has not taken any uh, treatment which can alter the PSA value, or if there is any contraindication for MRI in the patient. Uh, and any uh, temporary causes for high PSA, such as prostatitis and uh, DRE examination or uh, after the patient is included in the study, if the MRI shows a uh, prostate CA that is T3 or T4 level, they exclude the patients. So those are the general exclusion criteria for these patients. If you consider the only the PROMIS trial, they have excluded also uh, more than 100 ml uh, milliliter prostate, larger prostates also, because they can't do the standard uh, uh, template biopsy in a large prostate. So that, that has uh, that is one of the limiting limitations in the study. Uh, now, if I compare the uh, process, what has happened in all three studies, all the patients in all three studies have underwent multi-parametric MRI. Um, in the PROMIS trial, they have all of all the patients have gone for a combined, uh, so they have classified the radiology ab abnormality in the MRI uh, by the Likert scale. So anything that is three or above has, has been considered suspicious. And then they've done a blind trial. All the patients have underwent first the template prostate biopsy and then the trust biopsy. Then they have seen if there's any difference in the results with the MRI. That is the PROMIS trial. To take the uh, MRI first trial, so they have done MRI for all and then they have done trust biopsy within three months of the MRI. Uh, then afterwards, after the trust biopsy, they have gone for MRI guided biopsy to see whether MRI guided biopsy produces better results. And that is only done for uh, lesions which are like a score three or more, similar to the PROMIS trial. In the 4M trial, uh, so they have done trust biopsy, trust guided biopsy for all the patients, systematic uh, trust biopsy. Only for the patients who have had an abnormality in the MRI, they have, done, they have also done MRI guided biopsy as well. Then if you take the results in the PROMISE trial, uh, multi-parametric MRI was more accurate than trust biopsy. When you consider the sensitivity and the negative predictive value. Uh, so excluding a cancer, uh, MRI was more successful. But if you take uh, specificity and positive predictive value, trust biopsy was more specific compared to the MRI. Uh, so the conclusion from that trial is that trust biopsy is not a good diagnostic test for clinically significant prostate cancer. Uh, you can use a multi-parametric MRI as a triage test. Uh, 
before the prostate biopsy so that you, you can avoid almost 25% of can, uh, patients who have non-significant cancers. So we can, uh, if you do MRI before the trust, uh, trust biopsy, we can avoid doing 25% of unnecessary trust biopsies. That was the conclusion of PROMIS trial. Uh, and if I come to the uh, MRI first trial, so they have categorized uh, based on the histology, they have categorized with the clinically significant prostate CA, A group, B group, and C group. If you take the A group and B group, both the guided biopsy and the systematic biopsy, they showed no significant difference. Uh, to take the C group, clinical significant C group, uh, I, I really see, uh, actually the systemic, systematic biopsy shows significantly less patients than the targeted biopsy. And uh, systematic biopsy has diagnosed more non-clinically significant prostate cancers than the targeted biopsy. So the conclusion we come from, uh, we get from MR, uh, MRFS trial is that uh, there is no significant difference for uh, ISAP grade two or more tumors uh, if you compare the targeted and the systematic biopsy. But if you combine both systematic biopsy and targeted biopsy together with the MRI, that gives a better uh, a detection of clinically significant cancers. Uh, if I come to the four, uh, third trial, the 4M trial, I hope I'm not confusing you by comparing all three together. Uh, if you go for the 4M trial. So that showed this uh, patient population was quite different because it showed almost half of the patients did not have non, uh, had a non-suspicious MRI. So they had avoided biopsy in almost 49% uh, of the patients in the MRI-guided pathway. So the conclusion from that trial is that in biopsy naive men, uh, compared to the trust-guided biopsy, if you go for MRI-guided pathway, uh, the detection, identical detection rate will be there for the clinically significant cancers. And um, we will only detect uh, a very few number of insignificant cancers. So that is uh, better for our management. And uh, only 4% of clinically significant cancers were missed uh, in the MRI pathway. Uh, so I would avoid the limitations. So if you look at the EAU guidelines for biopsy naive patients, they say, uh, always perform a uh, multi-parametric MRI before prostate biopsy. Uh, and uh, when you go for biopsy, it's better to go for a combined targeted and systemic biopsy, systematic biopsy. Uh, those are the main uh, derivatives for these patients from the EAU guidelines from these studies. Thank you. Thank you, Achutan. Uh, you have done a great task. Uh, analyzing three very big trials and uh, you have summarized it very nicely for us. Uh, uh, sir, anything uh, to discuss uh, regarding Actually, these, this? <coughs> Actually, these recommendations are for any particular PSA cutoff and less or oh, all patients. Because we see most of them, our patients are metastatic and advanced disease. Yeah. This may not be relevant. If yes. there are sort of a PSA cutoff that you would recommend to do these things? Uh, so actually, I didn't go through that exactly, sir, but I think uh, higher PSA values, all patients, you can do, sir. So if it is sort of doing an MRI first, yeah, and MRI doing first, subsequent yeah. biopsies, maybe PSA less than 10 or 20, no? These recommendations? Yes, yes sir. I'm about that was the point. This is mainly for sir, T2, uh, suspicious disease of T2, not uh, T2. Uh -huh. Okay, right. Fine. Yes, sir. Right, thanks. That's what I wanted. Yes, so it's really for T2 lesions, no? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Okay, okay, good. Achidan, what is uh, meant by uh, clinically significant uh, prostate cancer? Uh, so they have grouped uh, different groups, uh, whether 4 plus 3, 3 plus 4, they have... Uh, in one group. Some groups, they are considered the core length of the biopsy. Yeah. Yeah. There are different classification. Yeah. I didn't go into detail in that. Yeah, I think uh, um, in most of the times... Uh, they, they have different definitions. They, uh, that is they, what they are grouped into. And I think among, among the studies, they have sort of uh, shifted the clinical significant uh, criteria. Yes, sir. But I think... Uh, the one in the promise is basically uh, Gleason's uh, 4 plus 3. 4 plus 3, yeah. And, uh, and the uh, call length of uh, less, than, uh, less than 6 millimeters, no? 6 
six millimeters. Yeah, more than six millimeters. More than, so more, than, than six, more. Yeah, more than more than six millimeters. So that is so that is one of the uh, one of the uh, facts that they argue uh, against because uh, again the problem is uh, if uh, if they go for a sort of uh, more stringent criteria like yeah. uh, Gleason three plus four. Yes. The sensitivity and all will drop down. Yeah, drop down. But then again, that will be applied to the truss also. So yeah. because of that, they at the end they said it's anyway better. So I think that so, is why uh, for the MRI first trial, they have grouped those uh, uh, clinically significant tumors into different groups, A, B, C. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So I think at the uh, I mean at the end uh, when you talk about the uh, uh, MRI in the prostate cancer, yeah. Uh, other than those other two trials that we mentioned, we need to we all have to mention the uh, uh, Promise trial and the Precise and the Precision trial. I think those yeah. are the three trials that we need to uh, highlight when somebody asks about the uh, evidence of, towards the MRI. And PROMISE is so special because it is something which we can uh, sort of uh, uh, discuss about the pre-biopsy MRI and the accuracy of pre-biopsy MRI compared to the trust biopsy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Achyudan. Uh, I gave this task for Achyudan uh, to compare these three studies, actually. He, he has done very well. Thank you. Yeah, young people, money, that's right. <laughs> have we finished all? Yes, yes uh, I think uh, we have uh, we have finished all. Um, uh, money, do we have more trials or we have finished our trial series? <laughs> Uh, I think so. Uh, the ma major trials which we need to discuss, uh, we have yes, almost yes. all we have done. Mm. If you have any more, we'll have another one. It's okay. We'll see how it goes. What does Nishanta say? Jenapadra, you have some more to discuss, uh, Nishanta? No, no, sir. I think uh, this is more than enough, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. But anyway, it's uh, good no, that we are discussing these things, uh, Nijanta. Otherwise, you would never have done. Uh, definitely, uh, this is uh, yeah. really good. And then uh, this will sort of widen the breadth of yeah. sort of knowledge. That's true. Yeah. They will think we are big professors, no? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. Just to know these few names and all, even that matters a lot now when you discuss things at Torah. Torah. Exactly. We look just dumb, although we know it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, yeah. yeah. So we can be in par with uh, British uh, graduates, postgraduates. So that's what that is our aim. So I don't mind having these discussions on and off, even after the exam or without the exam. We'll see how it goes because I, of course, enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah, then uh, we can continue it as a journal club, sir. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's true. Is, um, yeah, uh, we, we. I think we. You have done that many years ago. Uh, yeah. I remember we all were given uh, some uh, sort of key right. papers and then we were discussing them. And, yeah. and they are very, very relevant, I think. Yeah. Uh, yes. Now that the online platform is there, we can do it better and easily. Exactly. Uh, less frequent, yes. We'll continue it, but if there are any more trials or we need to discuss any papers before the exam, I will ask Balagobi also. We can yeah. have another session. We'll see. We'll play it by ear. I think the trainee's point of view, uh, I mean, uh, in the exam point of view, we just need to sort of, um, we, 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 we don't have time to sort of discuss any trial in detail. Yeah, so yeah. I think we need to sort of have, like, for example, if you take the, uh, the PROMISE trial, that's you right. Need to know, you need to know one or two key figures, like, Exactly. exactly. About, yeah, sensitivity mm. of the MRI is ninety percent, and the yeah. trust biopsy is around forty-eight percent. That's so, right. Yeah, something like that, and then you can just uh, give a you know within a couple of seconds you can give that answer mm. and move on. You don't That's have right. any sort of uh, hang around there. 
So that's right. I that's think right. Uh, for the exam point of view, if we can sort of put it in a bullet form, all these mm. important studies, uh, and then keep it in a piece of paper. Yeah, that's right. Lay out. Otherwise, we will never be able to. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Just to impress the examiners, no, I So, Tilina, you have done a very good job, and all the presenters did extremely well. Actually, I'm very happy, and uh, we'll wind up uh, today's event also, and we'll see whether it's necessary to continue or not. Uh, you all must decide. Whatever it is, we are happy to join. Anything else you need to tell? Um, no, sir. Uh, I think uh, again, uh, just to thank all the presenters and uh, yeah. uh, the two people, uh, two or three people, very important to thank as always you and Dr. Balagopi for all your uh, efforts uh, in helping us out. As every day we keep on uh, relying on you for yeah. uh, guidance. So thank you very much for all of that, sir. And uh, I think uh, we have another uh, Euromed coming up this weekend on Saturday. Yeah. That is going to be another interesting session on prostate cancer. Yes. And uh, I think uh, we'll meet on Saturday. Right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.